good Tuesday afternoon, everybody. Hope you're having a good week. I'm here uh, with Brittany. Brittany is our publicist here at NLPG Master Books, and also my daughter. Hey, everyone. So, and I am Randy. I am the vice president of sales and marketing here at the press. And um, so today we're going to talk about writing strands, which uh, writing strands is actually one of my favorite. It's it's one of my favorites. Is it one of your favorites? You don't really know. I don't really know, but because you asked me, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, well, we are joined by people in the app, so see. make sure to say hi if you're in the app. Jess I see. is over there. Hey, Jess. Desiree. Jess, it's been a little while since I've seen you, so it's nice to see you again. Whitney, yeah. Carissa, Carissa, Desiree. Hey, everyone. If you're over in, watching in the Facebook live stream, drop a comment. Let us know you're there just to make sure the live is working and just to say hi. Uh, Mrs. Thomas. Yeah, we got a lot of activity in the app. That's awesome. All right, so writing strands. Feel free if you have a question or a comment about it. Um, I think one of the things that happens when you step outside of convention if you step outside of the box, sometimes you end up spending a little bit of time explaining yourself. Let me give an example. When I was a teenager, uh, many, many moons ago, I had hair that was rather long, like halfway down my back long. And I wore dark tinted sunglasses. Now that today wouldn't be creepy. But in those days, it would or wouldn't be creepy. It would be creepy. In those days, it followed a persona that was, was kind of normal. And I was a hard worker, and I, I had never drank, never smoked, nothing. You know, I was a clean-cut kid, except for my appearance. Well, because I wanted to have long hair and dark-tinted sunglasses, I had to work a little bit harder sometimes, or explain myself a little bit more so people understood my heart was pure, even though my head wasn't. Make sense? Oh yeah. So, writing strands is a little bit that way because it's outside the box. It breaks convention. And so sometimes people will come into the program and they'll be like, oh great, it's a writing program that's gonna be just like the writing programs we've used with other curriculums or in public school or private school. And writing strands was birthed out of a different vision. And in the post that I put up earlier today, I put up a, a video of um, David Marks. If you go to YouTube and you type Dave Marks Writing Strands, it's an audio only video. David Marks was the author of the Writing Strands series. Uh, I think he wrote the original copyright is 1988. It is actually one of the early homeschool curriculums. It was written for homeschooling and one of the very early writing curriculums that was on the market. It's been available in a classic form for a lot of years. So it's been tested and has some great testimonials of people who did the course, succeeded in life. Um, but listen to that video. Take the time to listen to that video because in the video, he talks about why he did it, why he doesn't spend a lot of time on grammar, but he spends a lot of time on, um, on writing and how the course teaches the grammar that you need to write it teaches how to do spelling a little different. There's a lot of concepts. So when you get to hear his heart a little bit, then you approach the curriculum. It has a different tone to it because it's like, well, this isn't just a check off the boxes. I've done my nouns, verbs, adjectives, you know, sentence diagramming, um, and now I go do my format essay, introductory, three paragraphs to support, concluding paragraph, bang, there's my five paragraph essay. It's not set up like that. And so I really encourage you to watch that video. I think it'd be very helpful if you're doing writing strands or you're about to. Now, let me, let me say this as well. I believe that of all the courses we teach, writing is one of the most important because we're teaching our children to communicate, right? The quote, the pen is mightier than the sword. For a student who doesn't like to read, write, if, if I'm a boy and I'm 10, 13 years old and I don't know how to write paragraphs anymore, explaining to me that, like Karate Kid, wax on, wax off, Mr. Miyagi. I think that's funny, because somebody once asked, 
who is Randy Pratt? And they said, he's the Mr. Miyagi of homeschooling. Walks on. <laughs> Danielson walks off. <laughs> uh, Anna Walter is watching. Do not make a meme. Anna, uh, Please. No, I would forget the meme. A gif? Yeah. Okay. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. Think of, think of Karate Kid, right? And maybe you haven't seen Karate Kid. But in Karate Kid, Daniel's son gets beat up pretty badly. And Mr. Miyagi, of course, is the guide who comes along. And he's a handyman who cuts bonsai trees. But he also is a master at karate. And so he takes Daniel's son aside and he begins training him. And so he trains him to wax the car this direction, wax off, wax on, wax off. And then he does painting, right? And you're going up and down and he has to keep Daniel's son. Keep it like this. And he does the training. I'm recapping the movie. Right, I know. He's trying to get all these household projects done while, while training him. But what he's really doing is he's teaching him how to do uh, muscle memory. So then Daniel Stone says, I don't get this. You're just making, you're just making me do your chores. Like, you don't, you don't even, this is, this is a waste of time. You just want me to paint your fence and wash your car. And, and all of a sudden, Mr. Miyagi starts smacking at him. Daniel Stone is doing all these fancy moves, right? I'm getting, I'm gonna get winded here, I'm teaching this. Okay, so Daniel Sun does all these things, and then Daniel Sun realizes, ah, oh, Mr. Miyagi was actually pretty smart. He was teaching me muscle memory so that when the, the conflict came, I had all the, the chops to do it. Okay, so this is how we get our kids to write. That's what they're doing, they're waxing on, they're waxing off. Every time you write a silly little paragraph about about going on a vacation with Aunt Millie, what you're really doing is waxing on, waxing off. So that when it comes time for you to step into the ring, your muscle memory, the brain memory is there. You know how to, do, how to write where the pen is mightier than the sword. So what you're actually doing is you're training to be mighty. Okay, so, so this isn't just we write to check off a box. We're writing because one of the biggest life skills I have is writing. Communication. When I have a person who's writing an email to me that's angry about the way we manage the Moms and Master books, my next um, paragraph to them, I can either make the situation worse, I can diffuse the situation, I can even help sell the situation the way I communicate. And it's so important that I have these skills. Not only that, but to be able to think the words that I'm choosing where does it take the listener? Persuasion is huge. It, persuasion is how elections are being won right now. The study of how we persuade neuro, neuro selling or neuro marketing is how we, how we manipulate the mind or work through the mind to have people go where we want them to. And so the word choices that we have, I've, I've said it before, where if I say, hey, um, save, save 5% or save 10%, Save is a good thing, but if I say take 10% off, there's two negative words. And so even though we understand save 10%, take 10% off is the same thing, our brain recognizes taking as a bad thing. So marketers typically will stay away from bad words like take, because take means I'm taking something from you. Save means I'm saving you something. Or, or that's a positive word. And so the words we choose is important. What I love about writing strands is he teaches the student to be mindful of, of the, the words that they're using, the descriptions that they will use, um, the settings, the characters, the tension, all of the things that are so important in writing, he, he teaches here. He doesn't teach uh, sentence diagramming. He gives an illustration in his talk about his son who went on to win or do poetry, be published for poetry, teaching in a college, all of these different things. And he never once diagrammed a sentence, was never asked once on a, on a um, standardized test or the SATs, ACTs, any college placement. They actually went to colleges and said, what do you require of my student?" And so the English professors told them, this is what we want students to be able to do. So I think his kid entered uh, college at like age 12, 
and and was an exceptional writer. And I believe he's teaching he was teaching college English in college. So the writing strands was more of a this is what you need to do to be a good communicator and a good writer more than this is a good grammar course. A good grammar course would be Jensen's grammar. Jensen's grammar will cover all of the um, all of the details that you're looking for with nouns, and verbs, and adjectives, and predicate, and predicate pronouns, and all the all those things. You're going to get that. Writing strands is going to teach more of a grammar as you go. It's going to give you concepts as you need them. Like if I'm if I'm looking at writing a sentence and I want you know here's here's a pen here is a pen is is kind of generic but when I add um, what is uh, adjectives when I add an adjective to it I can begin to you know here's a plastic black lightweight pen now the mental picture changes and so through the use of an adjective which are descriptors of the noun now I'm actually able to take you someplace when I'm writing this I so wish that I had had a course that would have taught me this it wasn't until college when I had an awesome professor that taught me how to write and why things were so neat as opposed to just you know check it off the box you got four pages of grammar to do and circle you know underline the noun once underline the verb twice and circle all the adjectives that didn't teach me anything I could identify a noun and I could identify an adverb but I couldn't use it intelligently to to make my writing better my communication better and so that's what we're looking to do any any thoughts yeah um Lori Ash so thank you doing world or sorry I said world story that's the abbreviation we use a lot of times for that uh writing strands next year with seventh grader but it looks a little intimidating can you tell us how the program works and is there a reading list yep yep I will okay so the program used to be there was a classic series um that was out for a long time it wasn't faith-based it was faith friendly, Christian friendly, but it was it was not faith based. Master Books is faith based. Everything we put out of here has to impact eternity. Like it needs to impact eternity. Interesting story. Our mission statement is actually ink on paper to touch eternity, but I've translated it touch to impact. You know, touch impact. Impact is a little bit more stronger of a touch, right? So I was notified, I was taken to the wall out front and shown that it says ink on paper to touch eternity. Do we need to change the mission statement because you keep saying impact? It's impact. I don't know. I, somebody spelled it wrong on the wall. But that's, <laughs> okay. So it has to impact eternity. It has to make a big difference in eternity. So we, we took the Writing Strand series and there used to be two tracks in writing strands. One was writing strands, one was reading strands. We said, let's combine this into, um, into one program. So now the writing strands is a combination of the reading strands, writing strands. I would encourage everybody to pick up a copy of the Teaching Companion. No matter what writing course you're doing, this just has phenomenal tips um, about teaching the writing strand series. The heart behind it uh, the writing process, how to correct problems in writing. I love the way he approaches this. This is so good. All of us need to feel good about what we do. Students must feel good about their attempts to write. Every time your students write, find something wonderful about it. Locate the best phrase, expression, sentence, paragraphs, or ideas, and talk to them about how well they are expressed. Have the student read these wonderful words to you. Have them read them to someone else. Have them read them to your class or, or discuss them to be, discuss why he wrote them the way they are and enjoy the beauty of words. You can't correct all the problems with one paper or all the problems this week or this month, even this year. If you find everything that is wrong with every paper, your students will become discouraged. Mechanical and stylistic problems are best solved on a need to know basis. Pick one or two problems a week to, at most to work on. For example, one week work on an apostrophe used for con contractions, the next week work on apostrophe for use of possession, and the next week work on another, and so on. I love the we eat an elephant one bite at a time. So rather than eating the elephant, trying to eat it all at once, we just break it down into little bits and make small adjustments. Um, 
there's common problems, there's issues on how to do the literature component of the writing strands, spelling rules are in, um, commonly used words, grammar, parts of speech and grammar are in here, uh, the genres of biblical literature, the scope and sequence, what students are going to learn where. So this is a really, it's not mandatory, but we would highly encourage it to work with a series as a teacher companion and a guide. And I have had other parents say that if they bought nothing else, this is what they would buy just to help them as a guide to scoring their students' work and, work and helping them. So does that include a reading list? Does that, or any of those include a reading list? No. So I'm gonna, I'll, let me explain the, the reading list. Give me just one second and I'll get to the reading list. Okay. Then we have taken the entire series and condensed it into six books. There is beginning one and two, intermediate one and two, and advanced one and two. We recommend this series. Now this is not really a grade-based series as much as it is a skill-based series. So you can use this almost any in any grade. We recommend starting in fifth grade. Now if your student is doing some decent writing, can write a sentence, this was can be used actually for third to sixth grade. Starting beginning one could be used with a third grader, but we would advise going a little bit higher. But you can start the series a little bit sooner if your student is doing well and has an aptitude and a desire to write. Right. So hopefully that answers your questions, Melanie, Rosalie, and Victoria, about their grade levels. Yeah, if you were to look at a grade, we would say recommended would be 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th. Those would be the grades that you would do this course in. Now, we have a readiness test or a placement guide available on the website. It's on the landing page for writing strands, and it gives just some ideas, like part one, student charting beginning one should understand basic sentence conventions, capitalization, punctuation, complete sentence, no parts of speech, noun, verb, adjective, etc. Be comfortable writing two to three sentences at a time, have a basic reading comprehension skills, and be able to perform basic analysis of characters in a reading passage. So that's why third grade, fourth grade, that could be a little bit sticky fifth grade they should definitely have the proficiency to step into this and also to be getting thinking more abstract in in the writing students in beginning two should understand basic sentence conventions beginning capitalization da 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 no parts of speech be able to comfortably write four to five sentences at a time have basic uh, comprehension reading comprehension and be able to perform basic analysis of a reading passage okay so you can place the student if you don't have any clue you could use this as a placement guide or you could say my students in sixth grade i'm going to go with beginning two because you know i think they have those skills okay so the way it's set up is writing strands reading strands um they they do they spend 13 i think it's 13 how many weeks? I think it's 18. We spent 18, 18 weeks writing, 18 weeks reading. That's 36, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so maybe math was more important than I thought. <laughs> okay, so we spent 18 weeks uh, alternating. Why do we want to combine reading with writing? Because good readers make good writers. That's the concept behind this. And through this, we wanted to incorporate a faith-based aspect. Most people look at a Bible and they say, oh, there's the book, that's the Bible, that's, that's the book. What they don't realize is that the Bible is a collection, it's a library. It's, it's, it's 66 books written by over 40 different authors in three different continents and three different languages. What's amazing is it's a library with continuity in that it all tells the story of one true author, the Almighty God, and it's his word, but it's a collection of books and it's pretty amazing, but it's not just one book. And so we want to, a student to understand that when they see a, a Bible, they realize, oh, that's basically God's library that he's given me. He put it all, he made it easy, and he put it in a collection of 66 books in this one book. But in that book, we're going to find history, 
we're going to find poetry. We're going to find um, uh, there's going to be prof prophecy and instruction. Like there's different genres in the Bible. And so when we read the Psalms, we understand, oh, this is the book of poetry. But when we read Genesis, we realize this is the history section. So when I walk into a library and I'm like, there's history, there's poetry, there's instruction, there's prophecy. Um, all these, you know, the, the different genres. Well, the Bible has, it's like a library. There's different genres in the library. And so as we go through different stories and accounts in the Bible, we're asking the student to be aware of some things. Like, what genre is this book? And, and who are the characters in this book? What is the setting? Who is the conflict? that happened, right? When we have, um, let's say, Jesus being tempted. I don't know if that's one of the stories, but let's say Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. The setting is the wilderness. It's a place of barrenness and, and hopelessness. You have Jesus, who is the hero of the story. He's the one who is vulnerable. Then you have Satan, who is, who is the one who is trying to tempt and steal and take away. He's the villain of the story. And, and then we have the conflict. That's the conflict that the villain is trying to take away and tempt the hero of the story to give up everything for a temporary solution. What's the resolution? The resolution is the hero of the story, Jesus, tells the villain of the story, no, you get behind me, like you have no, you, I, you, I'm, not, I'm not submitting to the temporary solutions that you're giving me. And then, and then how do we apply that to our own lives? The application of that story. Well, the application is easy, right? As, as sons of God in, in, in Christ Jesus, that same villain tries to tempt us to give up our birthright, to give up the things that are valuable to us long-term for short-term gains. And so we see through the example and through the story, the, the setting, the characters, all of these things that apply. And even, even, in, this, even in the setting that... Jesus was in the wilderness, so it's a place of weakness, and I can apply this to my own life, and the richness of Scripture and application, which is essentially what a pastor does every Sunday when he takes a Scripture and he makes it interesting and he breaks it down. Who are the characters? When did it happen? What's the backdrop? What's the conflict? What's the application resolution? And what's the application? And if your pastor does that, services are really interesting. And if he can do it in fewer than... 30 minutes, it's even more interesting. Which you always did. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what we do is writing strands one week, and then the writing strands, it teaches the skill for writing, and then the next week, they spend time um, reading. So they start with scripture verse, and it goes through it and asks them some questions about the scripture verse. Then it gives them the option of, okay, once we're done with this exercise, pick a chapter book. Here's why we don't have reading lists. We feel it's very important for you as a parent to know what your student is reading. And we don't have the staff right now to vet all of the books. A lot of people are very comfortable with the classics. So the classic reading companion, which I don't think I have, the, um, we have the 50 classics, the uh, Christian's Guide to the 50 classics. Some families will use that as a guide and pick some classics you got to be so careful because the worldviews of some of those authors and what they're teaching can plant seeds. And so we want you to be very careful. Some students love reading books about baseball or history or, or maybe it doesn't have to be fiction. It could just be something. And, and you can still do a literary analysis on a chapter book. So they can read a whole book in the week. They could read a couple chapters. Like whatever the student is capable of doing. And pick a book that's interesting to the student but really begin to ask them questions like, what is the book about? What are you learning? Um, and, 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 you know, what is the conflict? What, what's the, the resolution? Are we beginning to see who the hero is, who the villain is, who, you know, the protagonist and all these people are? And, and that's part of this, this series. Okay, so through the writing strands, they do the writing. Um, there is a lesson, like most master books, Let's see, table of contents would be, yeah, there's a course description, a how to read, evaluate, the genres of, yeah, we have the law, the historical narrative, poetry, prophecy, the gospels, um, and then letters, 
there's a mastery where it's actually weekly skills, like you could print this off in, in, in each lesson. In lesson one, this is how you could almost grade if you wanted to. In lesson one, can they write a sentence? Skill mat, yes. Write a sentence with adjectives. Oh, like my pen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Write a sentence with ad separating adjectives with commas. Can they do that? Yes, no, maybe we need to revisit that and spend a little more time on it. So this course is almost like the growth hacking concept where you do it when it works, move on. When it doesn't, revisit it and try to, to build on it. The spelling list, this is, I'm going to read from this and then I'll see if anybody has any questions. The research on how people learn to spell indicates that spelling mastery comes from spelling words correctly through the practice of writing. Words studied in isolation and abstract lists do not carry over from the study to correct use. This page is not to be used as a word list to be memorized. Rather, it is for the instructor to keep a record of the words the students have problems spelling. Turn back to this page after each exercise. The record that the student the, and record the words that the student wants to work on in future use. If the student picks out one word a week, one that is used constantly, and the next week is spent working on that one problem word, the student will remember it with much better than if it had been memorized for a spelling test. More importantly, the student will have mastered several words without the frustration of unsuccessful testing. To help the student learn how to spell the problem word, help the student find the word's origin in a large dictionary, study the prefixes and suffixes, and practice the basic spelling rules that apply. And so his spelling, as you create a word, you, as you're going through and scoring, there's going to be problem words. Those problem words that students consistently have problem with, that's where your spelling words come from. And then you work on that. Then we have the daily schedule. And so the daily schedule tells through um, the 180 days, like this week would be uh, reading, writing, then reading, what pages, go to the writing, and what worksheets to work on. So it's pretty much open and go. But I did post the video from Tana Meyer that where she talked about there needs to be a little bit more hand-holding. Writing requires parental involvement. It's just not one of those things. Like the student can go write, but you have to take time to read it and talk about it and think about it as Mr. Miyagi, right? We're refining skills. And so as a parent, we're not playing the role of taskmaster or boss. We're a coach, we're a mentor. And so as they write, we're looking at their work and we're asking them to please, you know, let's, let's be more smooth. Get your hand up, bend your wrist when you come up type thing. That's what we're doing. And so it requires us as parents to get our head in the game and be a little bit more active in, in coaching them in writing. It's not like history or, or some of those courses. Mm -hmm. All right, I have three questions. I'm gonna kind of combine into one. So Lori over on Facebook, Sonia um, in the app, and Mrs. Thomas would like to know, um, is it typically recommended to complete language lessons and then use the placement guide to transi transition into writing strands? Some parents do opt to do both, but they are each complete language arts programs. I am doing both with my daughter, but only because she really enjoys writing and I want to help her grow in those skills. We are using language lessons for good grammar foundation. So, and the other questions were like, is it complete or is it a supplement course? Okay, so it's a complete course. You can do it as a course. In fact, if you do the writing strands intermediate um, in ninth grade, that would count as a one credit for uh, composition, English composition. I know some students some families do do the writing component along with the language lessons. I think you can do both from the standpoint of language lessons is going to give a little bit more grammar, some of the foundations of grammar. But it's also the thing that I love about language lessons is that it teaches the abstract thought. So you're looking at picture studies or you're looking at reading something or you're drawing and you're connecting different parts of the brain. So as far as the development because writing, my understanding is writing uses different parts of the brain than grammar. But when you use grammar with writing, you help make connections between both. And so I think language lessons is really good with that. If a student enjoys it and can do it, maybe you do, maybe you spread it out a little bit or something like that. But you can probably help give the student a little more variety. And you're the teacher. So if there are things you don't want to do, don't do it. Or maybe you just want to do the literature component. 
pick writing strands beginning one and do the reading strands component. Instead of doing it one week, take two weeks to do it. So that way you have kind of a reading component and pick books that you, are, you feel good as a family letting your students read. Um, Amber said, are you saying we could choose a book from the Bible or a novel for the reading weeks? Trying to get a good picture of what this will look like for my ninth grader. We do both. So the Writing Strands has the Bible in it. So one lesson they're actually going to go through, and they're going to go, let's see, okay. So an intermediate one, I am going to see, and for some of those who might have done this um, like if you've done some of the earlier versions of our of the master books edition of Writing strands, it's just gone through an entire remake and um, Places that needed to be cleaned up a little bit have been have been improved and where just there were some friction points with it Okay, so like this comes to reading lesson four, day 37. We're studying character and plot Read Bible passages 37, 1 through 36. And then they're going to ask certain questions every time. That's always a standard question. So we want the student to be thinking, uh, who is the passage about? And what is the cultural or historical setting? What is the genre of this passage? Obviously, if it's Genesis, it's going to be history. What is the intended meaning of this passage? Some questions you can ask are, what fallen or sinful condition is being highlighted in this passage? What prompted the author to write this passage is the message about sin, salvation, faith, hope, etc. Step four, can you list other Bible passages that help define the intended meaning? Concordance would be helpful. Uh, step five, once the original meaning is understood, seek to find simple life applications. So again, you're looking at setting, character, uh, conflict, resolution, and application. Discuss the following. What is the plot of the story? Okay, so then this goes to um, the chapter books. And so with the chapter book, you can choose any book you want. And it doesn't, like in, in our most advanced, it uses Pilgrim's Progress, and it does it over the course of the year. So it's not like they have to read a novel a week. If your student doesn't enjoy reading, then break it out. If they love to read and they consume reading, let them read as many, but get them thinking through breaking the parts down. Even in marketing, there's a concept called story brand, by Don, what's his name, not Don. Yeah, Donald Miller. Donald Miller, yes. Um, and his book is called Story Brand, where he explains that in marketing, we want a hero, we want a villain, we want a guide, and that's, all successful stories have this. So in the homeschool for us as marketers, you're the hero, the villain is your mother-in-law, and we're the guide who says, your mother-in-law's wrong and you are successful, and bang, right? Everybody's happy, unless you had a good mother-in-law, and, and, and like I do, and then it's not a problem, then the villain is the little league baseball coach who doesn't think you should be homeschooling. And again, Master Book says, he doesn't know what he's talking about, ta-da, you're a hero. We give you the tools to become the hero. That's, yes, yes. We're just here, we're just here, not, we're not the hero. Right, we are You're the, the Mr. Hero. Miyagi's. We are helping you become Wax the on. hero. Wax off, Danielson. <laughs> um, a little bit earlier on in the video, uh, I'm gonna ask this question because there is a little bit of a crossover. Marie said, would you do it with language lessons five and six or instead of, because at grade six, it would be like language lesson six, yeah. language trans beginner would both be about sixth grade. Yeah, again, you're, this, is, this is your classroom. What do you want for your student? You don't have to do both. I, I would recommend, my, my standard recommendation would be language lessons from first through sixth. When they finish sixth grade, do the writing test for the placement guide for writing strands and see where they place. If they place in intermediate two, then move them from writing from language lesson six into the appropriate writing strands. That would be what Kristen, the author of language lessons, my wife, and our curriculum editor, that would be her recommendation. But if you feel that the writing strands information has value too, then I would I, you could certainly incorporate that, or like I said, do the reading so that you were getting the literature analysis. 
component of it. Um, Kim asks, does language lessons four, five, six teach character traits and analysis to prepare them for beginning one level? Does language lessons teach character? Does it teach character traits and analysis to prepare them? Basically, does language lessons prepare the student for writing strands specifically? No. No, I wouldn't say that there's a that there's an interface there. I think I think it does it's conscious of the move into writing strands, but it's not set up as a trans it's not set up to transition. They're two different series. Okay. Um, we may have to have a lifeline call on that mm -hmm. if that's Jess said, you guys always make me laugh. We make ourselves laugh. It gets us in trouble. Sometimes we're no longer allowed to sit next to each other in church because we usually end up laughing out loud at something that we shouldn't be laughing at. And yeah, we, we have attended a rather large church and we've gotten the evil eye. A few times and we're like, oops, sorry. Kid. Just gave us the evil eye from the pulpit. What's that about? Exactly. We were just trying to encourage you. Yeah? yeah, we were giving feedback, instant feedback. It's the dance here. The, what's that? Whip, Nene. <laughs> I don't know the dance. <laughs> Anyways, um, Jess said, so I'm bomb at Alley, my oldest of four, base, uh, four basic subjects set back in February. Yes. As I was planning to homeschool this fall, when my kids' school shut down, I withdrew my kids. We busted into our master books. That's when I learned Alley was really lacking a lot of skills that should have been taught. We were using writing strands intermediate one, but I thought it was too much, and so I bought her language lesson six. That's what we are currently working on. So do you think I should get writing strands beginning level addition to language lessons level six? Hopefully my questions make sense. I would I would recommend just do language lesson six, right? Why punish your child? Like you've got time, you've, if, and there's enough time to do all that you want to do. So go from. Do language lesson six. If she's doing well with that, she could go even a little bit faster, accelerate through it. Um, sometimes with like learning gaps and things like that, you don't necessarily, um, you can accelerate through things faster because some of the content she would know. So I think you'd be okay doing that. Unless you really, if, if your student loves to write, I don't, I don't know that I would. The, uh, yeah, that'd be, that's good. I just said there's nothing wrong with that. You guys are just happy people. That's what I That's think. what we tried to explain to the deacons when they ushered us out of the church. <laughs> they did. They did. <laughs> uh, but sometimes, too, we laugh to cope with the sadness or anger, too. It's just, you know. I grew up in church. My dad was a pastor. And so, you know, it's notoriously well known that pastor's kids are usually the worst. And I was also a pastor's kid, so... And unfortunately, your pastor dad was not that well-behaved, typically. So services could be interesting. Yeah. The combination just... My funniest church story, yeah. I'll go off on a little story, is serious song. I think they were singing, you know, an altar song. One of those, you know, just as I am or something. And the kid next to me stood up and there was a tambourine in the pew. And so... Took the tambourine. I still think it's hilarious. I took the tambourine and I slid it over next under him. And so when they said, you know, everybody be seated, he sat on the tambourine and it flopped. And there were wooden benches at the time. Yeah. And that one got me a trip to the front of the church, actually, where I was asked if I would like to have discipline administered in front of the entire congregation. Right then and there, after we sat down on it, they knew that she I did was, it. yeah, well, you couldn't help it because <laughs> I was like, everybody was pointing at me. But it was funny. It's hilarious. It was, and the Lord says, make a joyful noise. And so I was completely in biblical authority and it didn't say anything about when was appropriate. So I hadn't gotten to or that part. Or how, of that. like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I was like making a joyful noise. And next thing I know, I'm in front of the whole church being asked if I'd like to be disciplined. That service was about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I will never forget it because I had to sit next to my father while he preached the message. Up on stage? Staring at everybody, looking at me, laughing. Because <laughs> they all thought the tambourine was hilarious. I remember sure. every minute of that night, even coming home and running to get into bed before my dad got home so that he would forget about it the next morning, which he didn't. Yeah, it is. I would have died if I had been there from laughing so hard. I, was. I thought it was very funny. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, 
Wait a sec, there was another question. Where did it go? It like bumped around while I was, while you were telling your story. Wait for it. Okay, Maria asks, so then how does Jensen's fit in? Do you do that in addition to writing strands or with the literature courses? I'm missing the flow for cu curriculum for language courses. I would, I would think Jensen's would fit more in as a high school course. I know he does say it can be used um, like eighth grade, seventh grade, that it's an intense course. The grammar course is intense. It's two years worth of grammar. Um, the way I like to describe, if you come up to me at a convention, I'm going to describe it this way. We have three different programs. Now, now we have four if you incorporate language lessons for a living education. Language lessons for a living education would be a prim and proper homeschool mom. <laughs> I have to be careful. Writing strands would be a hippie in a VW bus. Jensen's grammar would be more of a business person suit and tie. And we have the Stobaugh um, literature course, which would be more of your college professor. And so when you look at all three of those, there are three very different approaches to things. I think the language lessons is a hybrid because it's, it's more of a Charlotte Mason influence. It's got more of the brain thinking. It's a more holistic approach to curriculum. Written by a homeschool mom who's homeschooled for over 25 years, nine different kids, graduated five, so tried almost every other curriculum and, and is aware of what the successes and failures were. So language lessons is a little bit in and of itself. Writing strands was, hey, what do we gotta do to get it done so we can enjoy life? The hippie in the VW bus. And then you have Jensen's, which is very, very rule-based. In fact, originally Jensen's was, you know, I forgot the, what's the tag, that the tagline? We took it off because it didn't tell the brain go positive, but it used to be something like, through hours and hours of redundant practice, you gain the skills. Oh, yeah. Anyways. I can't remember. Yeah, so right, right, Jensen's is great for grammar application. And I think Jensen's vocabulary is great for, for learning. Um, you know, that would be helpful for testing, for standardized testing and, and uh, entrance exams. Um, and then their format writing is about a format essay, how to write essays and, and that. So it's a little bit more conservative. Was that the end of your description or are you continuing? I'm done. Okay. Because Maria said, that makes sense. Thank you for explaining. Now I just have to figure out if I'm a hippie or not. Oh, thanks, Randy. <laughs> I think what's most important is your kids. Because I've had kids where I'm like, I love writing strands. Because, man, I would love to just be like, you know, let's, let's just Mr. Miyagi on, Mr. Miyagi off. Some kids don't like that. Only Daniel's son like that. <laughs> Only Daniel's son like that. <laughs> Randy's son and Daniel's son. That was Randy's son. Randy's son. I'm going to change your desk, the nameplate on your desk. Randy's <laughs> Randy son. son. Uh, Randy's son don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so some kids like that. Other kids would very much like to be in a class with an instructor with other kids drilling right so i think it's a little bit based on what your student would be more inclined to would the student like more of the free out of the box descriptive writing or would they do better in a in a more traditional setting yeah uh whitney says she has to go make supper but she's really enjoyed and appreciated a lot today so hope you're making nice something yummy you. yes it's nice having you i hope that we'll see you on tuesday uh, Barbara said, I like the comparisons. It helps me understand the personalities of each. And Mrs. Thomas said, how do we go about correcting their grammar if we are far from experts ourselves? I'm worried I won't notice their mistakes or know how to fix them. Well, the teaching companion is going to give you some good guidance. Um, I would definitely look for the communication style. Something that we've seen that was really good. Sometimes you have a student who is going to school who is a good writer. Like my oldest, when she was in college, um, people paid her like five dollars a paper to score her students work so one family had three students they would write an essay they would give it to my daughter she would correct it make corrections give it back to them they would correct it give it yeah the mom had to pay a little bit to have the student do the work but she was also getting some really good um, coaching on the courses outside recommendations and then 
Uh, it was also good for the college student because the college student was also gaining from correcting. The best way to learn anything is to teach it. And so it was, it was a great relationship that way. So if you know somebody like that who maybe could make, you know, could you use a few extra bucks just looking through my stuff and grading my students' work, that would be um, something that you could do as well. Awesome. Just said, I've gleaned so much from this. Thank you so much. P.S. Your church story is the best. I'm still cracking up from that story. <laughs> I am too. Many years later. Many years later, it's still just as fun as the day you did it. <laughs>